everyone, this is Achuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology, and today we are going to take a look at Venus's entrance into the sign of Leo. Now, a lot of you have joined my channel in the last year and a half. We've had a huge amount of new subscribers in the past year and a half or so. It's been really great to see the channel grow and meet a lot of new people online and social media and stuff like that. Um, a lot of people don't know that several years ago, I completed a series taking Mercury, Venus, um, and Mars through all 12 signs. So today we're going to do a rewind episode in honor of Venus's entrance into Leo. Uh, a couple of years ago, I made a video on Venus into Leo. I think you guys will like it. And also more broadly, I hope that it points people to this resource that I have in my archives. You can find a playlist with the planets through the signs, uh, at least Mercury, Venus, and Mars. And I guess the sun is in there too, the sun's meaning in all 12 signs. Um, you know, uh, a lot, again, a lot of people just don't know that it's there. There's a ton of stuff in my archives to look through. So um, I, I figure it might be good because I get emails all the time from people, especially when a planet's about to ingress into a new sign. People will email me and be like, hey, can you talk about Venus entering Leo or Mercury entering Cancer or whatever the case might be? And so over the summer, as I've gotten those emails, I just decided, you know, I'm just going to point people to the series now and then and just kind of rewind and refresh on those videos because they're I think they're they're evergreen content. I mean, there's some really good deep dives into those planets through the 12 signs. Hopefully we're doing the moon next. That's a plan. I have a couple of other series I want to kind of um, address first, but I think probably within the next six months to a year, I'll try to take the rest of the start taking some of the rest of the planets through the signs and continue the same style of episodes. So if you if you like those episodes, let me know in the comments section and uh, make sure I do more of them. In the meantime, don't forget to like and subscribe, share your comments, click the notification bell for updates. You can always find a transcript of the daily talk that you listen to on my website, nightlightastrology.com, where uh, next week we'll be promoting two new classes, um, a planet and planet moon circle that we'll be meeting on the new and full moons next year. We're going to be walking through the astrology of the year uh, in new moon gatherings and full moon gatherings while also dieting certain plant teachers. Uh, my wife and I will be leading that together. Really excited for that. I probably have Ashley on to promote that and talk about some of the upcoming astrological energies and she can give us some more herbal advice if you guys have seen any of those episodes we do together they're pretty fun There'll also be a master class series that we're promoting next week so stay tuned for those things uh and yeah i hope you guys will enjoy this uh this rewind episode and um a look at venus's entrance into the sign of leo all right take it easy everyone hi everybody this is adam ellen boss from nightlight astrology and this is another episode of planets and profile this is actually the last final episode of planets and profile since when i first started it with venus anyway uh it began in virgo so last episode of planets and profile for venus because we're all the way around to leo which is uh taking us full circle so in this uh episode we're going to look at venus in the sign of leo and the idea here is to give you um some tools so that you can interpret the meaning of Venus and Leo in a birth chart, if it's yours or someone that you know, um, or so that you may interpret Venus and Leo as it's transiting through the sky, which of course it does every year. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at Venus in Leo. <clears throat> I'm actually going to put this into full screen mode here. All right, so Venus in the sign of Leo. Uh, now, what we have to understand, as I've mentioned in every episode thus far, is how ancient astrologers actually looked at a planet when it was in any sign, its own sign versus another sign, the sign of another planet. Um, what it basically boils down to is that we have to understand what Venus wants, who Venus is, uh, what she's up to, so to speak. And then we have to understand what happens when Venus is the house guest outside of her own signs, for example, of Taurus and Libra, uh, or even maybe outside of her exaltation in Pisces, how does Venus behave when in the home of another planet? Or put in a different way, if Venus has a set of natural desires, habits, um, preferences, fears that are natural to Venus, then how does every other planet act as a host for Venus when Venus is in that planet's home? So when we're talking about Venus and Leo today, what we're really trying to figure out is, how does Venus behave and how are Venus's needs addressed when uh, Venus is hanging out in the temple of the sun? Because Leo is the temple of the sun. So first of all, let's start with the um, basic rundown of Venus. Venus is the goddess of love. Love, harmony, friendship, beauty, the arts, sensuality, desire, sometimes lust. These are all Venusian topics. Venus is related to women and the goddess, sisters, and um, uh, daughters even. So 
Venus has this um, uh, very multivalent symbolism. But some of the things that Venus wants to do all the time are to harmonize things. For example, you take unlike things and you look for similarities between them. Like you know that friend when you're at a party and uh, the friend says, oh, you know what? You two have this in common. Brings you two together to talk and, and you find out that you have something in common. That person that we call a matchmaker, whether it's romantic or otherwise, has the ability to take people that, you know, on the surface, we might connect in at a party and be like, you know what, I'm not sure we have anything in common. But somehow that Venusian person knows, sees the way you have something in common, brings you together. Venus is always doing that. So what we want to understand now is if that's what Venus wants, if that's what Venus is seeking, in addition to all these other topics we mentioned, like love and, and romance and beauty and art and color and sensuality, that if Venus is trying to harmonize and bring beauty and enjoyment to sensual experience, if it, Venus wants to adorn things, Venus is also related to hygiene and cleanliness. Venus wants things that are clean and beautiful, uh, well-ordered even. Uh, so if that's what Venus is trying to do and bring this kind of beauty to our lives, then how does Venus accomplish that while hanging out in Leo, which is the hot, dry, masculine fire temple of the sun. Okay, so we put all of that together now. Venus is thus reliant upon the sun. In any chart that you ever try to interpret the meaning of Venus in, you want to look at the position of the sun and you want to see what, I would recommend, for example, this is a little advanced, but looking at what phase Venus is in. Is Venus an evening star or a morning star? Is Venus combust under the beams of the sun or Kazemi or anything else? Um, Venus is not usually going to have aspectual relationship with the sun because Venus travels uh, one to two signs away from the sun all year round. So it's not like you're going to get a Venus opposition to the sun um, uh, or even squares. So um, <clears throat> knowing a bit about Venus's particulars, um, you also want to see um, if the sun is in a good house or not when it's in Leo. Because when Venus is in Leo, as the sun goes, so goes Venus. They're connected. So you have to look at both. Um, in ancient astrology, it's not so much that you look at a sign and you say, what's the meaning of the sign? As much as it is that the sign qualifies for you the uh, character of the planet. For example, Gemini is really telling you about Mercury. This is Mercury's double-bodied or mutable, airy temple, masculine. Virgo, this is Mercury's double-bodied feminine earthy temple. Very different, um, but still qualifications about Mercury. So what we're really doing in ancient astrology is learning to blend planets, blend planetary meanings. Um, in modern astrology, sometimes we place a lot of emphasis on signs as if they somehow stand apart from planets. But signs are really the homes of the gods, the homes of the planets. So that's what we're looking at. Okay, so how to understand Venus when it's in the dry, hot, dry, masculine fire temple of the sun. Venus is reliant upon the sun. Got to see how the sun's doing. We also have to remember the sun's seasonal, or Leo's seasonal solar qualities. This is the middle of summer. It's the yang half of year, very masculine time of year, a light dominant time of year. However, every day the sun is dying. It's heading downward towards the autumn equinox and its arc in the sky, here in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. This is all symbolic. You don't have to take it literally. So the sun, which is the source of light and life, why place it in the middle of summer? Well, because one of the things that we know about the sun is that it rises and the sun sets, right? And so one of the things that's obvious about the sun is light and life. But we also have to take care of that element of the solar archetype where the sun does set, death does come. And so Leo, like the legacy of kings in ancient astrology, Leo the lion associated with kings and queens and the monarchy and things like that, um, how does that relate to this idea of the middle of summer but the light is dying? Because in order to keep civilization alive, generation after generation, you know, decade after century and so forth, you have to have a center around which everything rotates and is organized. For example, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Presidency, the Senate, the, the organization of government, or a king, or a queen, an emperor, or an empress. But you have to have a godhead. 
that becomes the center that symbolizes the eternal life of the civilization, despite the fact that everything is dying, everything tends toward chaos, entropy, will fall apart. So where does this symbol of eternity come in? It comes in during the middle of summer, the time of light in the midst of death, as the sun is setting during the middle of the summer already. So uh, setting on the solar year, so to speak, the, the, the days are growing shorter during Leo. So this duality has to do with uh, trying to keep the light forever, even though you know that the light will eventually die. That's the legacy and succession of kings and governments and rule and, and also fame right? Fame has to do with living on. We remember those bright stars. What is the sun? A star. We remember the stars because of the legacy they set, the image, the eternal images they portray on the screen, right? The sense of something being great, but so many stars, of course, die young, right? You see what I'm saying? So this idea is that uh, with Leo's seasonal solar quality is also that there is the sense of legacy, of living on despite eventually dying. And the, uh, that goes along with fame and rulers and uh, people with great promise. And also this childlike sense with Leo of having an important legacy. I'm the son of the king. I'm the son of the queen. We all feel that way inside. These are Leo's seasonal solar qualities we always need to take into consideration when reading any planet in the sign of Leo. So first of all, Venus and Leo can struggle with solar issues, meaning pride, arrogance, vanity, the desire for fame or fortune or riches or glory, all of the things that any king or queen might struggle with, Venus and Leo might struggle with, especially around relationships and love. I'm all important. I'm so special. I'm so great. Um, I'm, I rise above the rest. I'm a king. I'm a queen. You know, Venus and Leo can be just sort of aggrandizing like that, just like the sun can be sort of like that, right? Um, and Sun and Leo can also struggle with darkness, right? The dark side of fame, the dark side of youth, the dark side of uh, anything that's solar is really light and bright. Just like Venus and Cancer in the side of the moon, Venus and Cancer has this uh, kind of nostalgic sweet quality and sometimes has a harder time exploring the darker side. Venus's darker side, of course, is lust, betrayal, jealousy, desire, you know, um, vanity. These are all Venus's dark sides. Similarly, Venus in the sign of the sun, I'm bright. I'm promising. I'm great. I make you happy. I look good. I, I was, you know, I'm a, I'm a child superstar or I, I'm, I, I epitomize something enduring and eternal, right? But you can't see my dark side, right? And so there's just some sense of the dark side that's there. So these are things that Venus and Leo can benefit from and struggle with. Remember, Venus also generally represents benefits, good fortune and blessings, good friends, people that give things to you, the association of, of women or, uh, uh, you know, women or girls or sisters, things like that, uh, daughters. So anything you could, you can benefit from those people in your life benefits, um, wherever Venus is in the chart, potential to receive benefits from those things. That's why Venus was called a benefic. Now, um, however, one thing that you have to remember is that, um, uh, again, uh, Venus, Venus has to bless according to whatever sign it's in. So when Venus is in Leo, it's going to bless through solar things. It's going to give good fortune through solar things. Sometimes that's fathers. Sometimes that's um, through fame or greatness or leaders or what have you. Sometimes there's a sense of being honored or awarded something, an enduring legacy. Uh, okay, so let's talk about some people with Venus and Leo. How about Madonna? Just that sense of the, the, the teenage, like angsty young woman, right, who becomes a, a sensation overnight. Many stories about the childhood star that becomes a sensation, that becomes huge, that their youth is somehow captured and celebrated, and yet the, sometimes there's a dark side that goes along with it. That's Madonna. That's also Michael Jackson. So think about that. Tom Cruise, right? Here's the, the, the glowing, like, you know, I'm charming. I'm kind of kingly. I'm regal. I'm so talented. Again, he was a teenager when he got discovered. Of course, there's a dark, dark side, which we all know. He can go a little crazy. And apparently he's like high priest of the Church of Scientology, which is a little crazy too. So, but you get the idea. How about Mother Teresa? She wins the Nobel Peace Prize, I believe it was, and uh, is this honored, celebrated um, 
feminine figure, but she's given royalty and honors by so many leaders in the, in the world. It's a Venus and Leo signature. And interesting considering that you know, she's this humble monk, but definitely ended up in the limelight. Of course, I know the controversy in the background with the Catholic Church and with Mother Teresa. She's a complicated figure. So, but anyway, just think about that. And there's, of course, there's the dark side. There's that dark side of Venus and Leo that can be there too. How about the 14th Dalai Lama? Again, highly awarded, celebrated, hosted by world leaders everywhere, came up as a little child, came into the role of Dalai Lama as a little child. Pamela Anderson, discovered overnight as a young girl. And she represents, what is she on? Baywatch, this sunny sort of, I think it's California, not Florida. I think it's a sunny California show, right? Uh, interestingly, um, David Hasselhoff, Venus and Leo as well. So just that kind of like proud, you know, everything's just sort of big and pronounced. <laughs> and so, or, or think about this, Coco Chanel, who becomes this incredibly famous uh, fashion designer, but what does she uh, make for women? She makes women's clothing out of sort of like men's fashion. She takes men's fashion uh, items or objects or apparel and sort of makes them hip for women. There's Venus in the masculine sign of the sun. Tori Amos. Have you ever seen Tori Amos with her bright red hair? And she has this just kind of queenly look to her, right? Just in style, you can just see it. Monica Lewinsky. She, she, this is going to be funny. She received benefits from the king, from the president, right? And of course, that was complicated. John Stamos, he's the kind of bad boy of the Full House show. Jesse, I think his name was, I don't remember. But anyway, he is uh, a bad boy, but he's in here, he's the lovable bad boy, right? So you have, and he has that big kind of like king, he's a rocker, right? Like, and that, that just kind of that big, like kingly rocker presence, motorcycle guy. He plays that in a, in a family show, very Venus and Leo. George R.R. R. Martin, right? Here's a guy who's written a book called Game of Thrones, and it's just wildly successful fantasy novel. And it's all about kings, right? And then a, famous, a woman, Khaleesi, who's at the center of the kings, all this game of kings. So very fascinating there. Roald Dahl and Tim Burton, Venus and Leo. Now, I believe Uranus is in there with, with both of these guys in interesting ways. But my point of bringing this one in, Venus and Leo for Roald Dahl and Tim Burton, both have this childlike thing going on. Like Roald Dahl writes like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And Tim Burton, of course, has a lot of childlike things like The Nightmare Before Christmas, but they play on darkness. They play on the darkness or shadow side of the light, right? How about Olivia Newton-John? Same thing. Olivia Newton-John has the, uh, you know, she in Greece, right? She's got both, she got both sides of her. She's like so sweet and then, you know, becomes the bad girl and she has got, she's got the mane going on and and all of this. So Venus and Leo, the, the light and dark side of the sun. Think about that, the light and dark side of fame, of legacy, of power, right? Just like that. And sometimes children, the image of youth, internal sunlight image of youth. I actually have Venus and Leo, sometimes benefits from the father, right? So I grew up in the Christian church and learned a lot about uh, study habits and public speaking and what it was like to be in the spotlight and became comfortable with leadership roles and stuff like that because I was raised by a father who was in those positions. So in some ways I benefited from, you could say I benefited very much from the kind of, uh, my dad, my father was an art, you know, artist. He's really a drawer. He's drawer. I think that's the thing. And he's a, uh, um, a poet. And, you know, so at any rate, there's been a lot of artistic and other benefits that have come from my father, Venus and Leo in my chart. Uh, in fact, I ended up writing a book um, about my youth and my relationship with my father, which became art somewhat artistically successful and was part of what launched my astre a career as an astrologer. If you ever want to read it, you can check it, uh, my name out on, on Amazon. You'll find my book called Fishers of Men, The Gospel of an Ayahuasca Vision Quest. So, uh, and that book was a lot about the men in my life and it was artistically the subject that mattered to me. So Venus and Leo, so that's interesting as well. Anyway, that's what I've got for you guys. I hope this will help you to interpret Venus in your birth chart or the birth chart of the people you know, or when Venus is traveling through the sky, you'll have a little bit better idea of what Venus is up to. But remember, you always have to check on the status of the sun at the same time, that as the sun goes, so goes Venus when Venus is in Leo. Okay, that's what I've got for you guys. Uh, take care and we'll see you next time.